And the reason that works is because it focuses on client success, solving the problem. And that's the piece, like the rest of the marketing levers don't work if they mm-hmm. don't legitimately solve a problem. If they legitimately solve a problem, all the marketing levers, you're going to love them. They're going to be fantastic. Like you're they're they're going to work. If it doesn't legitimately solve a problem, you're going to be like, because at the end of the day, that's the heartbeat. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're here today. I think we've kind of got a cool episode. This is a little bit different than some of the stuff we've been talking about, but I do think, if you have been following along, that it's in continuation. Um, you know, we've been working a lot this year on sharing some of the philosophy and point of view um, that we have on marketing, on go-to-market, on on all of those things. And so today Ryan and I are going to talk a little bit about that and in coincidence with uh, a book that uh, I've been writing that is coming out very soon. Um, I would even dare to say this year. So um, I got awesome. three months. That gives me three months. Yeah. To, yeah. To go ahead. Out. Um, state, state that out loud. Yeah. So, if I'm putting it out there. So yeah. it, it was actually supposed to be done already, Ryan. Um, but as things like this are, as creative things like this, you know, it's, it's really more important for it to be right than to be fast. And, um, you know, delivering the absolute best quality, the best quality that I can is important. Sorry. I had it set up for when I do in-person recordings here and I was only recording on one side. I don't know if you hear that or not. I've only got one headset in, so I oh, wouldn't, okay. wouldn't be able to tell anyone. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm Perfect. good. I didn't know. I was already doing it yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's it's been a it's been a real journey, but I want to share a little bit about that and uh, and dive into that. So how are you doing today, Ron? So I'm, on other notes, after my monologue, yeah. how are you doing? Yeah. No, I'm I'm doing good. Uh, kids are all at school, so all three are out of the house for the next like two hours. So it is quiet. We've got a dog that we're dog sitting, and it's like laying downstairs watching duck dynasty. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm did, doing did, good. I ca- did, did I, did I catch that right? The dog is watching television. Well, I don't know if this dog likes that or not, but I thought if I'm going to be up here with the door shut, maybe that will keep it like, make it not feel like it's alone and like whine at the door the whole time. So I'm yeah. going to try it. Um, okay. But yeah, so yeah. I guess, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say to each his own. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well it's not my dog so um we're just dog sitting but yeah so I, I guess the kind of diving into it i don't know if it's how about like what's the name of the book that's ah, maybe start yeah. there but like if you want to go as high level as possible that's probably it what is what is the name of the book that's not as high level as possible but <laughs> yes yes the name of the book is cre- the art of creating demand Mm -hmm. And it is how to use clients, content, and community uh, to supercharge your go-to-market. But Mm -hmm. I think there's there's more to it than that. That's uh, obviously a very marketing-friendly title. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think it really kind of comes back, Ryan, is like anything in life, the frame of reference, our frame, looking at anything really determines the reality that we experience. And while those words kind of sound fairly ethereal, it's very literal in, in how we perceive things. And so that's what I've noticed in, in the years that I think back what it was like when I was younger and, uh, being in a family business and no one that I, that I had access to was a marketer or was good at marketing. And so my frame on marketing was that it was this kind of unknown. I don't know. I had something like took over my whole screen, but my frame on marketing was that it was just like this, like unknown and confusing thing. Like I didn't, I didn't even know. I didn't know what it was. I didn't really know what it meant. And so that affected how I viewed it. 
right? Um, mm-hmm. I think when we first went through the process, because I remember being in a, in a business pre-website, you know, pre-web era. And when we went online and, you know, we built a website and we created videos for it and we did TV advertising and we went through these things, my frame of marketing expanded, but it was still very much limited to the people that I had, you know, that I was working with. Right. So like mm-hmm. what the web developers, told me, I, I'll never forget this. We did this website. This was in the mid two thousands. And I think we spent close to $20,000 on the website. Mm-hmm. And, um, we get to the end of it. Right. And it's like, I remember that last conversation they were delivering it they had this beautiful office in Winston and we went and visited them and they were like showing us the final thing. It was beautiful. I mean, it was just totally beautiful site, like way ahead of its time. And, um, I think we were getting ready to leave and I can't remember these guys names. The name of their company was frogmen. Um, just like right. so weird, so right? Like they, were they definitely weren't like, were like ex Navy SEALs or anything. No, like that, or? no, they weren't military types at all. No, weird. Like these guys were creatives. Yeah. Um, we said, okay, so now your next job is to drive traffic to the site, and I'm, I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. He's like, yeah, you got to get people to go there, and so then the natural question is, well, how do you do that? He said, I don't know, you know, write a blog or something. I think blogging is, <laughs> is a really good thing. Okay, guys, thanks for coming. See you later. Bye. Yeah. And it sank in that building this website, which what my frame of marketing at the time was if we built something, the people would come, right? Like, yeah. because that's a fallacy that we believe as business owners. If we build the thing, if we have the right mousetrap, the people will come. Yeah, feel the dreams. website and they let us know. And I didn't know this, but at the time they were letting us know nobody was coming. Mm-hmm. And they never did. In fact, I think the only people that ever saw that website was when I'd be at someone's house or they'd be with me and I'd be like, hey, <laughs> check out our website. <laughs> yeah, and you I'd see my like website. Brochure. Right. I'd have the computer. I'd open the computer. I would get on the desktop. Right. And we'd look at the website together as if I was mm-hmm. carrying a paper brochure, except for mm-hmm. this one, with the videos and stuff. Yeah, I, I, I see that a lot of times, too, with people who make videos like who don't have a good strategy to drive traffic to it. Like you'll see four or five, 10, 15 views on a video and you almost instantly know, like, no, that's the person who made the video. They've probably watched it five or six times in their office. Yeah, yeah. The marketing per- person's probably seen it a couple of times and then the guy's mom probably watched it a couple of times. And, yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, this helped me come to a belief and this was a message we used to share with people. Um, when we first really got into making video for clients and building creative out, it was don't make the mistake. Cause it started, I started to realize like every company was doing this, right? Like, which is what you're saying. They mm. would pay a videographer to make a video and then they would put it on their website, but no one was going to the website. Mm. So the video would just die there and no one would ever see it. And, you know, it was, don't do that. Like, don't, don't make, don't let your hard work, don't spend thousands of dollars to make something that, that no one sees. And what I've realized Mm -hmm. over the term is that these frames that we have about marketing really rule our perception. And in my opinion, my belief is that's the thing that holds us back most is, is simply we don't have the right lens and sorry for the video pun. But we don't have the right lens to look through. And if we don't have the right lens to look through, we don't see the right things, right? So we we have this total misunderstanding. And if we have that, how in the world are we supposed to get to where we build an effective strategy or we know what to do day in and day out that's going to promote our business? Yeah, no, I I agree. I think that there's certainly a, a time and place for websites and videos that don't get seen a lot. Like if you think about, Hey, this site is going to be one of our sales tools that as we're closing a client, we send them this website, they can take a look at it. They can see our pricing, whatever it is, or, Hey, we're going to make this video, like a product video that is made for our distributor. So they can learn more about our product. Like, yes, that doesn't have to drive a lot of traffic, but I, I, I certainly see the difference when you are trying to create demand for your product or where you're trying to create demand for your business. And it, yeah, it is extremely unfortunate how much money is probably wasted 
on video that gets no traction, that gets no customers in the door, that creates no demand. And I, I think that yeah. is probably what leaves a lot of people feeling like, hey, this is a waste of time. Like, what? let's just go back to our, our traditional sales methods. Let's do our cold calls. Let's do do all this because, hey, we made this video and we've got nothing to show for it. Or, or maybe they made a video or maybe they did some social posting or whatever and they have yeah. no way to tell if it's working or not. Uh, yeah. Like, obviously on YouTube, you can look at view counts and all that, but I think most people run into the problem of not being able to tell hey, is this, yeah, maybe we got a bunch of views, but is that actually driving traffic? Is that actually driving sales? Like, we don't know. So yeah, how does, how do you make, I guess, that transition then? So what, yeah, what if that's the old way of doing it in the way that you've seen failures, like what is, what is the, I guess, the right way or in in your view, what is the the better way to do it? So I think the first thing is, to and I and I, I we, we can I'll get into answering some of those things like specifically, mm -hmm. but the first thing is to recognize something that we all know is true, and that is that business, all of business, your your business with your your team, your business where it concerns your customers, um every part of your business really rises and sets on relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, the phrase that, that played in, plays in my head when I say that is, you know, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right. Or I think the version of that, that that's kind of gotten put out there, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Maybe that's more of a marketing version of that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it all rises and sets on relationships. And I think we all know this. Right. Like that's not a revelation right. to say that. Right. We all know it intrinsically. Right. Like our sales are built around who we know, like our referrals are built around who we know. Um, being able to find the next person to work on our team and join the team is all about who, you know, I mean, how do you find your employees? I mean, typically it's someone that works with you or someone that, you know, refers you to somebody or you recognize someone inside of the sphere of your daily life, whether that's like Ron said in our conversation yesterday. Um, I just can't remember when it was, but when we had that conversation with Ron, right. yeah. and he was talking about like, you know, when you meet the, the, the waiter and you see something special in them, right? It's all right. about relationships. And I think this is where the frame gets, that's off with marketing is we forget, we get over to marketing, we get over to advertising, right? Mm -hmm. We get over to social media, we get over to all these things. And it's like we, we have this like thing we know that's true about life. It's true about our business. And then we forget. Mm -hmm. And then we like we, we, we go and we go there for and forget that that rule applies. That at yeah, the I, end of the day, it's a relational, it's a relational thing. And so that's the first frame that I want to give people, right? If I give every business owner a different frame, it's that like marketing, great marketing, you have to look through the frame of relationships. So, so how do you, how do you do that as a business then? So, so my, my thought is, and, and you talk about the sum in the book also is you, you try and speak to three different people, right? You have typically the CEO is going to have a role, the marketer is going to yeah. have a role and the salesperson yeah. is going to have a role. Yeah. And, and I, I see a lot of times an issue being, Hey, relationships are great. Like, yeah, let's do the the long term stuff. That's that's going to work as far as down the road. But like, hey, we need sales yeah. today. And and so, how do you how do you talk to the CEO or how do you talk to the salespeople when they're all of their like all of their goals are based around, hey, in the next month, I need this many sales, I need this many closes, I need this many phone calls, whatever. And well, here's, how do you the, here's break the thing. Out of that? Here's the thing. Like, if I want to sale now. It's going to be reliant on me to call a prospect or a prior client that I already know, mm -hmm. right? Like if I want to sail this afternoon and, and I'm thinking like, again, we're talking in that business to business world, right? The B2B mm -hmm. world where most transactions are significant and significant transactions, significant business relationships usually have multiple decision makers and their processes they're not considered on a whim like 
-hmm. most B2B transactions don't happen in like, oh, I'm on Google. Oh, there's something. Oh, I bought it. Right. right? There's, there's usually a period of, is this, it does, you know, what's the problem I have? You know, is this the right solution? Can I trust this company? What does the, the process, what's the pricing? Does it fit within my budget? You know, what does the process look like? How long will it take to onboard? You know, what can I expect in, in terms of results? You know, what does your customer success relationship look like? You know, um, all of those things are factors and usually more than one person is part of making that decision and, re and considering that information. So if I want sales this month, I'm actually reliant on people I already have relationships with, right? Like I'm reliant mm -hmm. on like calling a customer and saying, Hey, do you know somebody that we, that you could introduce me to, right? Mm -hmm. Relationship. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm reliant on the fact that my sales team has been doing work and that there's people in the pipeline that already are familiar that I have a solution. They're already considering it. You know, we've already built trust and relationship and I can call them and maybe push on the sale, right? Like if, if I need sales now, which is always the thing, right? Like, how are we going to drive revenue now? How are we going to drive revenue? Because everybody's thinking, like, right? That's mm -hmm. what the leadership, that's what everybody wants, right? It's, it's how is it going to right. show up on this quarter's numbers when we report. Mm -hmm. All of those outcomes are only going to happen if we've done the work ahead of now to build those relationships. If we're mm -hmm. starting cold, whether we're talking about making YouTube videos or making cold calls, it's going to take time to go through the actual process of people going through those steps mm -hmm. and building sales, which is the fundamental motion of all B2B, right? Like that's what, right. that's the old guard, right? It's all about sales. What did those guys do? They went one by one in their cars, right? They get in mm -hmm. their cars, they throw some product in the back and they'd drive around the country, they'd knock on a door, they'd set an appointment, and they'd go show it to somebody, knowing full well that they might have to come back. And I, I, there's a friend of ours um, who used to be in business with my dad, and he still does this, his hardware sales, like cabinet hardware wholesale to, to retailers. Mm -hmm. And most of his business is just going and sitting with the retailers and working on their relationship. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like he's not pitching them the product. He's pitching the relationship and he keeps showing up and they'd show up over and over again. And maybe it would take two appointments or five appointments or a year or 18 months. And then eventually the timing would be right and they'd shake hands and they'd do business. Mm -hmm. At the highest level of business, deals are done based on relationship. When companies are bought and sold, it's not... It's not done like they don't put an ad in a, in a listing book. Right. They call people they know because it's important who knows and who doesn't know. Right. So mm -hmm. the, on the, in the most basic and traditional sense of business, we've been doing this for years relationally. We've just been doing it one-on-one. -on -one. And as we get these younger generations, they're less interested in getting the phone call from the mm -hmm. sales guy. 50 years ago, you relied on the phone calls from the sales guys because that's how you found out about product. Mm -hmm. That's how you, that's how you kept in touch. Like there wasn't an internet to go to, to research what I might want or need. The salesperson was the person that had the information and they were the gatekeeper to the mm -hmm. things I needed. Cause if I didn't buy those things, I couldn't do my job. I couldn't make my cabinet. I couldn't build the machine. I couldn't mix the chemical. I couldn't uh, I couldn't put it on a truck and send it somewhere, right? I needed those salespeople to come interact with me and educate me on what they could do for me, right? And if they yeah. didn't, I just didn't know. Yeah, we talked a lot about that when we, on our uh, podcast about trade shows, right? How, how mm -hmm. trade shows have changed and how they are no longer the, the place where you go for information, they go to the place for networking. And I, I think a lot about too, even my neighbors in the neighborhood, they don't answer the phone. Like, like if I have an issue or if I need a, the other day we saw, we walked by our neighbor's house and saw that his door was just left open at night. And I tried to call him and like, I know that this guy just doesn't answer the phone anymore. Like, so I had to, I called him and answer. Then I got on the phone, text him. He texted me back five seconds later. I'm like, yeah. I just called you. I just yeah. called you. I'm yeah. like, what's going on? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. And so it's not, and this is the thing, right? Like mm -hmm. to me, this is like this big aha mm -hmm. is that I think, that most people who are under, 
and this is so dangerous for me to say this, it's going to like <laughs> up on somebody's toes, that are under the age of 50 for sure. Mm-hmm. And obviously this line moves both directions. Right. It's a, it's a spectrum. There's a gray bell, bell, It's a bell curve. Right. Yeah. But oh, whatever. Yeah. when you get in Gen X mm-hmm. and younger, they've recognized that we have to do different things. Mm-hmm. And they see that, right? And we see that, oh, people are on social media. People are on researching on YouTube. And we know they're getting on Google. And that's why we pay all these people to do all this stuff. What are you telling me, Brad? I know things have changed. Mm-hmm. But here's the part. And this is why this frame is so important. With that, we take the old thing that we realize we've got to do something new and we leave the relationship part in the past with it. Mm -hmm. And then we make this assumption that because we're in a digital world, because things are being done differently, that we're not still humans doing human things that rely on the same triggers, the same psychological steps, the same trust and authority and reciprocity, you know, and, and, um, you know, we rely on community, we rely on seeing other people do, those are all relational triggers, right? And they still exist in the modern world. So we have to bring that lens over and say, wait a second, relationship still matters. So the question is, how do we bring relationship into modern marketing? And that's the part that I see missing as a fundamental when we're standing at 20,000 feet and looking down is that we're forgetting that we're still humans doing business with humans. And so I think we have to get back to the basics of marketing and rethink how we're approaching things. And part of that is part of that is we've been sold lies. And I don't I don't mean that as in like I'm not pointing fingers at anybody specifically. But we've been sold lies that if I have the right mechanism, right, the right and the word that gets the word is the funnel. Mm -hmm. I have the right funnel. Right. And it has the right steps. Right. And we we have the the right landing page and it it squeezes people and they can't go here. And then we take them to this step and we offer upsells, downsells, side sales. We do all this stuff. And the fancier Mm -hmm. it is and the more automation. I heard that word recently. I won't say where more automations we have in place, like the more effective we'll be like, that's the secret. It's not the secret. Automation just save time. Right? So like, sure. again, we go back to traditional salesperson. They went in, the person wasn't ready to buy. So they had to make a note on their note card. And that might said, I'm going to call them in two weeks. I'm going to mm-hmm. get home and I'm going to send them this sample. I'm going to, Oh, there's somebody that they need to meet. I know somebody a town over that really helped their business. Well, let me call that person to introduce them. And so the, uh, there was no automation. The follow-up was all by hand. Today, we can use automation, which is all it's doing is saying, instead of doing it by hand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trigger some of those same things. But the things that we want to trigger are the same pieces that we would have always done, right? We want to make sure that we follow up with people, that we get them additional information that they need, that we're continuing to nurture the process and make sure that they continue to think about us because – they're getting introduced to a lot more things and a lot more messages and a lot more noise today than they were 30 years ago, even, or 20 years ago. Yeah, right. I, yeah. I, I think the, the quickest way to have a failed campaign in like social and the social landscape in general is to ignore that side of it. The, the relationship side. If you think about, because I think the the temptation is to go in and say like, Hey, we're going to use Instagram. We're going to use Facebook. We're going to use all these different social platforms. And that's where we're going to advertise. That's where everyone is. So we're going to put our ads there. We're going to do this. We're going to do that and remove the relationship side because you think, Hey, that's where everyone is. Let me just go stick some ads on there. Let me go make a pop up or whatever it is now that as they're scrolling through, like, Hey, they see our, our brand, they say 20% off and, and that's, what's going to get them to buy. Cause that's where they are. But yeah, I, people forget that that is the, like the quickest way to stick out as in a bad way. It, like that is the, the quick, Hey, swipe, swipe out of the way. I'm, I'm out of here. I don't, I don't want to hear from that guy. And so, yeah. So what, it, what is the approach then? I guess I know in the, in the book, you kind of talk about from, from like square one to, or I guess, 
I, w- I don't want to say level one to, but like you've got starting at the beginning, there there is a, a path to it because you can't just go and mm-hmm. start advertising. So so what is the what is the route? I guess at like a high level to take then as if you could yeah. break it down in five easy steps, what would it be? What would it be? So it, it, it's funny you should say that, Ryan. Um, <laughs> there, there are five levers, but before you can pull the levers, we have to we have to get started on a good foot, right? Mm. And so that means that we need to get back to what is the basic, the root of marketing. And that's a two part thing, right? It's two pieces and we take them for granted entirely, which means there's opportunity in it. Anything someone takes for granted, especially something that has tremendous value, there's opportunity in it, right? Like, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like buying the thing that everybody needs, but everybody's forgotten about for five minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. Those two things are who we serve and what we solve, who we serve and what we solve. And this is where it all starts. And we take it for granted. We serve, well, who the people that buy from us, our customers, Mm -hmm. who is that? Mm -hmm. And my advice here is, and we're going to spend an episode diving into this process because I want everyone to go through this process. But my advice is, is that we, 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 we take the paradigm and we flip it. And instead of thinking top down, we think bottom up instead of thinking big and aggregate, instead of thinking avatar, we think small, we think individual, we think ideal client. And so that's all I don't want to get into the depth of that. But if we think from the bottom, we think the specific example, and then we use that information because it's specific and it's relational. Right. So we have that. The second thing is the problem that we solve. Another thing that we take totally for granted and we think of products. Often we have products where like, hey, I think I can make a great margin on that product, which makes total business sense. Mm -hmm. But we're not necessarily considering. And so we start there. We're like, well, I can get the raw material really cheap. Right. Like I'm thinking like, Mm -hmm. you know, blending chemicals and stuff that I have some some background around not doing it, but in business around it, around selling it. And it's like, we can get the raw materials really cheap. And, you know, our margin on that is way higher than if mm-hmm. we have part over here. This part over here, we can only mark up 30% because our, our distributor is a jerk and they're, they're killing us on it. But this, we can mark up like 4X. Right. And so then we're like, okay, what good is that chemical? Well, people could use it for this. And so we have this way of doing the equation. It's like, what is a good product for us? And then we go try to invent why it's good for the client. And that, again, we got to flip the paradigm, Mm -hmm. right? Because we love our products. We love our, I love my ideas. I wrote a book. We love (laughs) love our products. We love our ideas. We love the things we can do or the things that we're excited about. And I heard it said recently, and I think this is the best, the best thing to keep in mind is don't be in love with the product, be in love with the problem. And the problem stems from the person. So if we take the time to get to know who the person is and, and what's going on with them, the challenges they're facing, the gaps they have from where they are today to doing X job or doing X job faster or being able to do more of X job, right? And then we say, okay, within our circle of competence, how can we solve that problem? And we're like, okay, we're doing A, B, and C. Do any of those solve that problem? Well, B kind of does, but you know, if we had made this little tweak to it, it would be an excellent solution. Our problem is we're not communicating that well because we thought, because we hadn't talked to them yet, we thought what the reason they wanted it was this other reason over here, but it turns out they want it for this reason. So we we repackage it a little bit, we change the words we use on it, and all of a sudden this B is the solution to the client's problem. Mm That is what you have to have, right? Like the, the thing that kills businesses that isn't talked about enough is good solutions. Mm-hmm. Things that are just okay. Middle of the road services, middle of the road products, products that people will buy, but they don't absolutely need products that don't solve big problems in conclusive ways. 
Yeah. Because when I, I look, sorry, when I was going to say I, I have, sir, I have absolutely personally experienced that too. Even, even in, in, in my last job, like we talked a lot about our distributors and how, how can we get the sales force of the distributor to, to sell more? And almost every time the conversation went down to, well, you know, like they've got other products I get a higher margin on. Maybe, maybe we can give them a little bit better margin and they'll be more encouraged to sell our product more. And I, like the entire framework was built around, Hey, we're competing against the margin. We're not competing against the need of the customer. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's extremely frustrating. Like day in, day out is, Hey, this sales guy's not going to push our product because he gets a 3% higher margin on this thing. So that's what he's going to go focus on. Not what's best for his customer is, Hey, we want, we want the biggest margin. Cause that gives me the biggest commission and the biggest, um, profit. So let's do that. And not instead go talk to the customer, figure out what they need and find the best solution for them. You know, I worked with a company for a while, Ryan, that shall remain nameless mm. and they had some amazing IP, mm -hmm. like really good stuff. They had taken a software that was a really innovative software, but it was a bit complex. Mm -hmm. And they built a process around it that solved a big problem. It's very exciting. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, they're sitting on this thing that is like, it's really good. Mm -hmm. But when they went to bring it to market, they had been implementing it one by one by one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right? High level consulting and coaching to implement this process, right? And because they had fallen in love with being very global in their solution. And I'm trying mm -hmm. to talk around this because I don't want to identify anybody. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, this global solution. But at the heart of their global solution, was this piece of gold, this sliver of gold that ran through it, right? But they wanted to sell mm -hmm. the whole global solution. That was problem one. They mm -hmm. weren't recognizing what they had. Two, they realized that they wanted to grow faster than they could selling one to one to one. Mm -hmm. So they, they took their IP and they repackaged it into a format that was scalable, that could be sold one to many. It didn't take into consideration that the implementation of this information was so intense for the end user, there was no way they could do it on their own without the handholding that had made it so successful in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's because we're looking at it just like you said from the wrong perspective. Of course, the business model where I take something that is intellectual property and I package it in something and I sell it to hundreds and thousands of people makes a ton more money, a ton faster than if I have to hand deliver it. Of course, it's mm -hmm. business 101, but the clients couldn't implement it without that, without the level of help. So it's a broken model because we think mm -hmm. about it from our, our shoes. What do I want to sell? What do I have great margins on? What's good for, for my quarterly sales this month? And the truth is, if we want that to be the outcome, and I'm not saying as business owners, we shouldn't want that. We have to go to the client and we have to say, what's their problem and how do I make them successful? And then mm -hmm. work backwards. You work backwards. Because the truth is, the truth is, if I, and I look at this specific example, there are plenty of consulting businesses that have scaled up and are multi-hundred million dollar consulting businesses. Mm -hmm. It's probably harder than just selling a bunch of stuff that's like packaged in an online course, right? It's packaged in a PDF, mm -hmm. but it's doable. And the reason that works is because it focuses on client success, solving the problem. And that's the piece, like the rest of the marketing levers don't work if they mm -hmm. don't legitimately solve a problem. If they legitimately solve a problem, all the marketing levers, you're going to love them. They're going to be fantastic. Like you're, they're, they're going to work. If they doesn't legitimately solve a problem, you're going to be like, because at the end of the day, that's the heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So, so you've got, so kind of walking through this and you've got your, you've got your ideal client, you know, who you want to talk to, you know, who that your, 
if you could have one client repeat it a thousand times, that's who you're going after, then you know you've got a good product. So then what what's next? So, so once you've kind of solidified those two things as a new business or even as an old business trying to to reframe how they work, what is yeah, what is step one? Getting into social media, yeah. getting into like what what is right. that process at a yeah, again at a, a very high level, but what is, what does that look like? Yeah. So this becomes to me, this is very uh it's like a foregone conclusion. But I mm-hmm. realize that when we talk about things like content and social media and advertising and communities and this and that, it all becomes very overwhelming. And I get it. When I sit mm-hmm. down sometimes, if I don't have a clear plan, it gets really hard to just zoom in and do the task, right? Like it's like, mm-hmm. okay, I, I mean, I built the strategy, but if I don't have it laid out, it's like, okay, what content do I need to make today? It can mm-hmm. be very overwhelming. It's like, uh, you know, right? Yeah. And yeah, so the idea do a is video about stuff. this, right? Exactly. And that's a hard place, especially when I get it. Everyone in the business, whether you're a marketer, and I imagine more marketing managers are interested in this than anybody, or you're the owner, especially if you're the owner. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what position you're in; you have a full plate. Mm-hmm. And this stuff often gets put as like secondary or tertiary you know, tasks that get done after the important stuff is done, which that's a different conversation, but Mm -hmm. so you need at least something clear. So that's really what this is, is to take some things that I think once we say them all, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense Mm -hmm. and kind of put them in into a way. And so that we call the system, the five levers. Mm 